Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching His Monstrous Father, Frederick the Great Part 1 by Extra History. You know, as soon as I saw Extra History had released this video, I knew we had to react to it. Now we've done one video on Frederick specifically, and we've mentioned him in a couple of other videos, but I'm glad with this series we're getting more time to specifically look at Frederick and his legacy. I think he's a really fascinating character in terms of 18th century European history. He's really one of the more influential monarchs of the era. He really laid the groundwork for all of these enlightened monarchs, enlightened despots to follow. A lot of that was based on Frederick and what he did. I think I'm going to have a good time digging into that throughout this series. So, if you guys end up enjoying this one, I'd appreciate it if you would check out the Patreon or channel memberships both of which can be found down below, and both of which will give you access to exclusive reaction content. Anyway, with that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. Fortress of Kustrin, Brandenburg, November 6th, 1730. Mm. Frederick, Crown Prince of Brandenburg, Prussia, looks through the bars of his cell windows as soldiers lead his companion, Hans Kevin uh. von Kata, to the Mound of Sand. Yeah, this is an interesting place to start. And the scene we're about to see is fairly representative of Frederick's entire childhood. Kata is more than his friend. He's the 18-year-old Frederick's confidant, his protector, and some say his lover. And he had Yeah, I, I think Kata was most likely Frederick's lover. Uh, that's the relationship they had. I to save Frederick from his father, the king of Prussia. And Kata would pay. Please forgive me, dear Kata. Frederick yells in French, the language they both prefer. In God's name, forgive me. There's nothing to forgive. Kata answers in the same language. I die for you with joy in my heart. The headsman steps up, revealing his axe. Frederick doesn't want to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the voice acting is a bit much, but it is a rather melodramatic scene. Uh, and a pretty tragic one at that. Watch, but two soldiers, acting on his father's orders, grab hold of him and press his face to the bars. He screams, he fights, the axe raises over Kate's bare neck, and mercifully, the boy who would become Prussia's greatest king faints before he sees it fall. Yeah. Now I'm sure you're already getting an idea of the relationship between Frederick and his father, Frederick William I. From that scene right there, this is something that we'll get more into this video, at least judging on the title, His Monstrous Father. Thanks so much to HelloFresh for continuing to help us bring history to the table. Hey everyone, as you can probably tell already, Frederick the Great's childhood was a horror show of abuse and homophobic bullying by his father. So yep. with today's episode, viewer discretion is advised. Frederick the Great is one of the most dynamic monarchs of the 18th century, mm -hmm. inheriting a fractured piece of the Holy Roman Empire. He's a fascinating guy. When we talk about monarchs of the 18th century, was Frederick the Great the most powerful? No, absolutely not. Was he the most important? Depends on how you measure importance. But Frederick the Great was absolutely one of the most influential. What Frederick did, a lot of monarchs after him would copy. You know, that really shows you how important and how influential he was on Europe and the world at this time. A place so minor, its monarch was called King in Prussia rather than King of Prussia. Hmm. He expanded it to a major power. Known yeah. as a soldier and a philosopher, his reign simultaneously encompassed refinement and brutality, demonstrating both the splendor and slaughter of the Enlightenment. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why Frederick is such a fascinating character. We have, at the same time, the conquest. He was a bit of a warmonger, but we also have the enlightened, refined philosophy, the humanity of some of his domestic policy. Now, some people see these two as clashing, and I think I agree with that perspective, but others, including Frederick himself, do not see these two sides of himself uh, in conflict. He unifies them under one philosophy, and we're going to see all of this throughout this series, I'm sure. Yet his first battle was not against the Habsburgs or France, but rather his own dad. Frederick's yep. father, Frederick William, was known as the Soldier King. 
Yes. So Frederick William was in some ways similar and in some ways very different from his son. As they mentioned, his nickname was the Soldier King. This is a good title for him to hold. He was very pious, austere. He lived a rather Spartan lifestyle. He was not really into luxury. Um, as I said, he was pious. He was very religious. He was this sort of austere, absolute monarch of Prussia who was rather conservative with his spending, but managed to really build up the Prussian military and turn Prussia into a rather important regional power. A lot of the stuff Frederick William would do, his son would build upon, um, which is kind of funny because they had such a disastrous relationship. I mean, frankly, uh, an abusive relationship. Frederick William abused his son a lot, and of course they didn't like each other very much, but a lot of what Frederick the Great would do would just be to build upon what his father had left him. Living in a sparse militaristic fashion, he mm. despised anything he considered ostentatious or effeminate. Yep. In fact, his first act upon becoming the king in Prussia and the elector of Brandenburg was to sell his own father's jewels, horses, and fine furnishings. Hmm. While many German princes... I mean, he was sort of this stereotypical, austere, Spartan, Protestant character that we might think of from this era. You know, no extravagance, no luxury, uh, just my personal relationship with God and my conservative habits and... You know, that's the kind of guy he was. Used the treasury as their personal party fund, Frederick William instead pursued a conservative economic policy, curtailing mm. state spending and battling corruption, which yep. was a wise thing overall, but many of the un... Yeah, the battle against corruption was one of Frederick William's biggest crusades, and, I mean, frankly, I think it was more a battle to make the state more efficient. Not necessarily a moral crusade, but uh, he really did work to decrease corruption, and to increase meritocracy within Prussia's government. And once again, these are missions that his son would continue. Frederick the Great would also battle to increase meritocracy, decrease hereditary privilege, and decrease corruption uh, during his reign. Necessary expenses he eliminated included patronage of the arts, literature, and science. <laughs> like, he didn't just defund the Prussian Academy of Sciences, he closed it. But Yes, and of course this is an area where he was different from his son. Frederick the Great could also be called a soldier king. He was also very militaristic. He fought against corruption and stuff like that. But Frederick the Great was very much into the arts, literature, science, philosophy. Uh, and he strongly promoted those things while he was in charge. Frederick William did have one pet project the army. So yep. everything he saved, he poured into defense spending. He also created a new type of military draft, the Canton system that allowed Prussia to be able to recruit and train troops more efficiently and create civilian reservists that could be called upon. Mm -hmm. In that way, he doubled the size of the Prussian military to 76,000 men, making it the fourth largest army in Europe. And that is remarkable. 76,000 men, the fourth largest army in Europe from this relatively small German state. Now, I don't know where Prussia would rank in terms of population, but its population was not that big. And yet it has this gigantic army, which Frederick William is building up to be one of the biggest, strongest, most professional fighting forces in Europe from this tiny little German state. So it's a really fascinating thing. And this is really one of the key ingredients to Prussia's rise to power. Roughly the same as that of France, which had 10 times Prussia's population. Oh, did this guy love the army. He dressed as a military officer, held meetings in rooms where he could watch troops drilling out his window, and in an additional <laughs> extreme, drafted the tallest men in the Holy Roman Empire into a special unit of giants. And to be fair, uh, I know some other countries would do this, uh, especially later on, I don't know, if others had already done this, but there are other examples of this kind of thing happening. As you can see, an army that matched or at least was similar to France's, even when France's population was so much larger. There's a quote from Voltaire, and I might be butchering this, 
but it goes something along the lines of, you know, most states have an army. Prussia, that is an army with a state. <laughs> and that really gives you an idea of how militaristic Prussia was. Um, under both Frederick William and Frederick II, Frederick the Great, you know, to some people, it really looked more like uh, an army and then secondarily a state as well. <laughs> In fact, his council was so full of soldiers, swilling beer, and smoking footlong pipes that it was nicknamed the Tobacco Cabinet, mostly because their <laughs> meeting room smelt like an airport smoking lounge. He also was prone to violent rages, which got yeah. worse as the years went on and had several medical conditions that kept him in constant pain. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure as you can tell from his values, he was not a particularly cheerful fellow, uh, afflicted with some medical issues, um, could get very angry, and like they said, have these violent outbursts that would get worse as he grew older, and oftentimes the victim of these violent outbursts would be his son, and I'm sure we're going to see that in the rest of this video. In other words, Frederick William projected an air of hyper-masculinity, Calvinist piety, and frugal financial habits. And yeah. naturally, he wanted his eldest surviving son Frederick, nicknamed Fritz, to grow up to be just like him a hyper-virile religious soldier king to use the great instrument of Prussian military power that he'd created. And the sort of funny thing is that that is what Frederick grew up to be. He was this hyper-militaristic soldier king who expanded Prussian power and Prussian territory through military action. Exactly what his father wanted. But in other ways... Frederick was very different from his father. He indulged in, uh, you know, the luxury of high society. He liked the arts, philosophy, poetry, all things that his father absolutely hated. Frederick the Great was relatively irreligious. He probably wasn't an atheist, but he was not nearly as religious as his pious Calvinist father. So, it's sort of an interesting thing. Frederick would grow up to be many of the things his father wanted him to be, but they had some serious differences that would cause a lot of tension in the relationship. Now, the first six years of Fritz's life, he'd lived with his mother, and under her care, young Fritz developed what his father considered worrying habits. Fritz <laughs> loved music and books. He grew in... As you can see there, he was a flautist. Uh, he played the flute. Incredibly close to his older sister, Wilhelmina, enjoyed poetry, philosophy, opera, and learned to play the flute. Worse yep. than that, it was the transverse flute, recently invented in France. Mm. Oh, Frederick William hated France and was known to fly into a rage if the country was even mentioned. And I mean, you could see why. Someone like Frederick William would absolutely despise the extravagance and luxury and high society of France Whereas his son, Frederick II, you know, young Fritz, absolutely loved those things. And he would embrace French culture, French art, French writing throughout his career. The French, he said, were decadent and effeminate. So imagine his consternation when Fritz, <laughs> who was tutored in French and German simultaneously, took to French as his first language and yeah. struggled with his native German. <sighs> Okay, all right, not a big deal. The boy, Frederick William reasoned, just needed to find the fun in war, you know? So, for his... And, I mean, look, Frederick William would get worse throughout the years, but I seriously doubt at any point his attitude was, all right, that's fine, let's just try again. He was very strict and harsh with his son. Dick's birthday, he gave him a miniature arsenal of military rifles and cannons, plus a group of boys in uniform he was supposed to order around as living toy soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, eh, Fritz? Fritz? You know? It's fine. It's fine. Because Frederick William would soon also shape his son more directly. For mm. as was tradition, the next year when he turned seven, the responsibility for raising and educating Fritz transferred from his mother to his father. As you can imagine, all studies of music, philosophy, and poetry were promptly shut down. The yep. prince would instead now have a grueling regimented schedule of Latin, religious studies, ancient classics, modern political history, and military subjects. I mean, we just have a situation where father and son are very, very different. The sad thing is that Frederick William really couldn't see past their differences because Frederick the Great was a very intelligent precocious, talented young man. 
And of course, he would grow up to be this impressive monarch. So it's not like he was lacking the qualities that were needed of someone in his position. But Frederick William really couldn't see that. He just saw the things that he didn't like about his son. And so he continually lashed out. Conducted largely by military officers. But even there, Fritz found allies. His Latin tutor was sympathetic to his clearly bright charge and not only procured him a flute, but helped him amass a secret library of 3,000 books covering poetry, enlightenment philosophy, and art. Yeah, well, you know, his father, Frederick William, might have been this Spartan, pious, conservative character, but a lot of the aristocracy of Europe, even the aristocracy of Prussia, had similar attitudes to young Frederick II. I mean, they enjoyed literature, they enjoyed high society, they enjoyed, you know, the elegance of the French court. Um, some of them even indulged in this new Enlightenment philosophy. Though, you know, a, a lot of them didn't do that particular thing, but a lot of them had similar interests to Frederick the Great. And so, it's not like he was alone. <laughs> he would certainly have allies who would help him. His father represents a particular kind of individual, and Frederick represents a different kind of individual. Um, and they would have had people who were similar to them within the aristocracy. I think, honestly, Frederick William I would have been more the outlier. <laughs> you know, his uh, austere attitude was probably more odd than Frederick's interests and likes. So, yeah. Fritz also visited a nearby court in Saxony, which gave him a glimpse of a freer life than he'd had. Yet as Frederick grew into a teenager, Frederick William became increasingly furious over his heir who yeah. he considered effeminate, incompetent, and irreligious, as it was increasingly clear that Fritz was an agnostic. So he mm. responded with a campaign of abuse. Frederick William berated his son, screaming at him in front of soldiers. He burned books and artwork he found and assaulted him in public. Mm. He would strike young Frederick for sleeping in and being late for drill or for being unsure on horseback. Once, he beat him with a cane for wearing a pair of gloves when it was cold. If I disgraced my father so, he once told Fritz, I would have killed myself. Jesus. And look, I mean, everyone says, well, you know, your experiences make you into who you are. And that's true, but <laughs> I think Frederick could have got to the point he got to without the harsh abuse, <laughs> you know? Like I said, he was always a talented, intelligent young man. <laughs> I think he absolutely could have evolved into an impressive military leader with a little bit more gentle guidance, at the very least without the physical and verbal abuse. And, I mean, it's only going to get worse. Then, when Fritz was 16 and formed an intimate relationship with one of his father's pages, yeah. Frederick William had the young man sent to a border posting and beat his son again, calling him a sodomite. Yeah, and so, I mean, you can see how this just gets worse, right? Frederick William already thinks his son is effeminate, and, you know, he he's not interested in the military enough, even though Frederick would be plenty interested in the military. Uh, he's into music and art, uh, and now he finds out that his son is in a relationship with another man. That just makes things even worse, and I imagine made Frederick William I even angrier and more violent towards his son. Now, a quick aside here. The language surrounding Frederick's sexuality can be a hot-button topic among historians. Yep. Not whether he was gay. He clearly was attracted to men, preferred male partners, and commissioned art with homoerotic themes. The debate is more about terminology. Yeah, so this is a big debate among historians in general. You know, we look at the past, and obviously there are uh, a diversity of sexualities throughout history, right? The question is, can we apply modern labels to historical figures? Now, Frederick is actually a more clear-cut example. Uh, it's very obvious that he was interested in men, and he doesn't seem to have shown much interest in women. So we're pretty sure that, at the very least, he was bisexual, and he was probably gay. The sort of question comes in that, you know, Frederick would not have saw himself as gay. That's not a term he would have used. And a lot of these historical figures who we might call gay or bisexual or transgender or whatever term you want to use would not have viewed themselves that way. And so we have to ask ourselves, okay, to what extent can we use modern terminology to describe historical figures? I don't have an answer for that. I think it's an interesting kind of difficult question. 
And I think in some ways, you know, you just have to put an asterisk. <laughs> you might say, oh, Frederick is what we would today call gay, though he wouldn't have seen himself in that way. I think that's sort of a fair way of describing it. And Frederick in particular, it, like I said, is a pretty clear-cut example. Like, calling him gay gets the idea across. Uh, he was... You know, it's not that complicated when we examine his sexuality, at least compared to a lot of other historical figures who we might only have rumors or vague snippets or we don't know at all. It can get very difficult to discern sexuality for a lot of these historical figures. Um, but the question still stands. And, you know, it's sort of an interesting debate, right? Whether labels like gay are imposing a modern idea of sexuality on a very different time and culture. Yeah. But let's be honest. In history, it's already common to use a ton of terms like feudalism or democracy to describe things that existed but didn't yet have labels, and queer people existed then as they always have. So with all that in mind, Frederick was gay. Yeah, I, and I think I agree with that. Um, they use the example of, you know, we use a lot of terms that people at the time would not have used. And so I think that's fair. Uh, and I think it's okay to use modern terms to describe history to ease understanding, to make it easier for us to uh, understand things, as long as we keep in mind that people would have thought differently at the time, or they wouldn't have used those terms at the time. For example, when we talk about, this is a very different example, but I think illustrates the same idea. When we talk about the Byzantine Empire, I'm always very clear that the Byzantines would not have viewed themselves as Byzantines. They would not have called themselves the Byzantine Empire. They would have called themselves the Roman Empire, and they would have viewed themselves as Romans. Uh, but I still use the term Byzantine Empire because I think it's easier for people to understand. Um, but when I do, I'm always clear to use that disclaimer. And I'll also just use the term Roman Empire. So that's a very different example than what we're talking about here but I think it sort of shows the idea. It's I think it's okay to use modern terms that were not in use at the time so that people can better understand what we're talking about as long as we're clear that they are modern terms and people at the time would not have identified with them. And his sexuality definitely made it dangerous for him to live under Frederick William. At this point, he had only one hope to escape his father, a double marriage. See, mm. his mother had been planning to marry his sister, Wilhelmina, and him to the children of her brother, George II of England. Huh? Fritz was all about this. He could go to England, which was far freer than Prussia. And look, if he had to get married to get away from his father, that was a small price. Yeah, and look, I'm sure Frederick understood the reality that he would have to get married to a woman at some point. Um, it was a political marriage. It's not like it was a marriage out of love. I mean, if we look at marriages amongst the aristocracy at this point, sometimes people would marry out of love, but I think more often than not, these marriages are to cement political alliances. And a lot of these aristocratic couples, um, and I'm talking about straight couples, um, were really not at all interested in each other. <laughs> you know, of course, Frederick was most likely gay, so he wouldn't have really been interested in any woman he was married to. But even a lot of the straight couples, uh, you know, the man and the woman had no interest in each other. They spent a lot of time apart. You know, they continually cheated on each other. Some of them even had a pretty clear mutual understanding. And so, though obviously Frederick wouldn't have wanted <laughs> to get married to a woman, given the circumstances it's probably not the worst thing that could have happened. It would have given him a bit of freedom from his father, and, you know, he wouldn't have had to be too close with his wife, and he would have just had more freedom to do what he wanted in that sort of situation. But when that deal fell apart due to mm. intrigue and shifts in alliances, he plunged into despair. That was when Kata, his friend, tutor, and likely lover, agreed to help him escape. And, of course, this is when we reach a low point. Frederick has plunged into despair. He sees an escape route, a bit of hope, and then that is very quickly snatched away. This was probably one of, or the lowest point throughout Frederick's entire life. They would slip away while touring the Holy Roman Empire and flee together to England, though they were caught almost immediately and thrown yeah. into prison. Given both were military officers, Frederick William charged them with treason and seriously considered having Fritz executed but that put him on Which rocky. is crazy. I mean, 
you know, his father is a very sort of authoritarian character. But to even consider executing, uh, first off, your son, but second off, your heir. <laughs> this is the heir to your throne. And he even considered executing him. This is a good look at Frederick William's character. Legal ground with the rest of the empire. So in the end, his punishment was to watch Kater die. Yeah. Afterward, Frederick made a deal with his father. In return for a pardon and getting to stay crown prince, he submitted to an even more grueling and austere routine of tutors. He also swore to be a good Protestant and agreed to marry. Mm. So he entered an engagement with Elizabeth Christine, a Protestant cousin of the Habsburg line. Though Frederick was despondent over this choice and swearing that even friendship between them was impossible, he yeah. threatened suicide, however, still had no choice in the marriage. And uh, we might see more of this later in the series, but there really was nothing between Frederick and Elizabeth Christine. In fact, he didn't even see her most of the time. They were, particularly after Frederick William dies, they will be completely separated. But he knew the only way out was through. Frederick wept upon meeting her, and on their wedding night, loitered in their bedroom for an hour before abruptly leaving to stroll the grounds until dawn. But yeah. no matter, he was safe. He was free, and he only needed to wait until the soldier king died, and when he took power, he would never be beaten again. For in a surprise to all, Frederick William's tutelage had taken root, and yeah. his son would be a warrior king like Prussia had never seen. Yeah. And what? Yeah, and um, and you can go and check out their video. It's linked in the description. Go check out their sponsor, all that good stuff. Uh, and yeah, that's the thing, like I mentioned earlier. Frederick the Great will become a very impressive warrior king, just like his father wanted. But his father really couldn't see past um, some of uh, Frederick's other personality traits, his interests. Um, it, it's kind of tragic. It's sad. Um, but it, it does mold Frederick into what he becomes. So, really fascinating. Uh, I really enjoyed this episode. I think a pretty comprehensive look at the childhood of Frederick the Great. Uh, and after this, we will move into the rest of his life, his reign, his career. Uh, some really interesting stuff. If you guys enjoyed this one, I'd appreciate it if you would leave a like, subscribe. Uh, and once again, check out the Patreon and channel memberships, both of which are linked down below. Anyway, I hope you guys are all having a good day today, and I will see you again next time. Goodbye.